All right, now, I love... I love celebrating the holidays that we celebrate. I really do. You know, there's people out there, especially you'll find on the internet, people will say Easter is a pagan holiday, Christmas is a pagan holiday, and they just get really upset over everything that's going on. Now, I don't believe that, um, you know, there's certain things that, that people have inserted into these holidays that have nothing to do with Christ. I mean, we don't celebrate the Easter Bunny because that really has nothing to do with Jesus Christ, but we do celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Easter is a proper term. It's found in the Bible, um, and, and it's not a pagan. I'm not going to get into all that. I actually preached a whole sermon about that last year, debunking some of the myths out there that say, you know, Easter is Ishtar, and it's all this pagan God worship and all this other stuff. Just like with Christmas, you know, we don't teach our kids that there's a, a man in a, in a red suit that watches everything that they do and make sure that they're good and they only get gifts if they're good and all this other. We don't, we don't teach them that at all. We teach them Christmas about the birth of Jesus Christ and that that's what we're celebrating. So do people add other things to holidays that have nothing to do with God, nothing to do with the Bible? Of course they do. Do we observe that stuff? Don't. But just because other people do other things shouldn't take away from what these events are really all about at all. And I'm just because other people may do other things isn't going to make me say, oh, I, yeah, I don't, I'm not going to celebrate Easter now. I'm not going to celebrate Christmas now because other people are doing things that, that I disapprove of. No, I'm going to, on Christmas, we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. My children all know that. It's a celebration. It's a time of giving gifts. It's a time to, to love one another, spend time with family, and, and talk about the Lord. That's what we do. Same thing on Easter. We're celebrating the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen good. What I also love about these events is that it kind of forces us to look at this again. At least it does with me. Every year in Christmas, we turn to Luke chapter 2. We read through the, the story of the birth of Jesus Christ. It's, it's a time that we may not give as much attention to if there wasn't a day set aside in order to do these things. Now, I know that the Bible doesn't have Christmas in here as something that you have to celebrate to be right with God, and that's fine. And if you don't celebrate Christmas, that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. It's not something that's mandatory by any means. But I like them because it does give us a time to recognize, to take a step back, and to look. And this morning, what I love about being here on Easter morning is that I'm going to preach a sermon about Jesus Christ and about his resurrection. And the title of my sermon this morning is called What a Wonderful Savior. And I like being able to, and, and maybe this is all, you, you, no, nothing is going to be new to anybody here. I don't know. And that's fine. Because you don't always have to get something brand new. Oh, I've never seen that before in the Bible. It's okay. Because we're going to recognize what a wonderful Savior we have, how awesome Jesus Christ is. And I like that term, wonderful too. That comes from Isaiah 9, 6. The Bible says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful. He's a wonderful Savior. That's a name given to Jesus Christ because it's an attribute of his. What does wonderful mean? It means he works wonders. It's amazing everything that our Lord has done. He's wonderful. And of course that verse continues on. Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, of the increase of His government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon His kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So we're going to go into a few aspects this morning about why Jesus is so wonderful, why I love him so much, and why you probably love him so much, and some things, some attributes that I think are very critical to know Jesus, to know who he is, and, um, and to recognize and honor and magnify who he is. So we're going to do some, some pretty basic stuff here, but we're going to get into who Jesus is, because it's important that we know who Jesus is. We have the right... Jesus. There are a lot of people out there that believe that they'll, they'll claim to believe in Jesus, but they come up with a different Jesus. The Jesus that we believe in 
We believe there's one God, but we believe that Jesus is one person in the Trinity, that God is a triune God, that there are three, the Bible says in 1 John 5, 7, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. We see in many places throughout the Bible, and actually turn, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 43. We're going to come back to John 20 if you want to put a bookmark there. We're coming back to John chapter 20. But if you want to turn to Isaiah chapter 43. First John 5, 7, as I already read, there's three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. Of course, we know from John 1, 1 that the Word is Jesus Christ. The Bible says, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So there's a concept being brought forth that you can have Jesus being with God and being God at the same time. Because there are three that bear record. You have the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. They are all God, but they're not three separate gods. There is one God. They, they coexist, are co-equal, are, are part of you know, what we might call the greater Godhead. But there is one God. And this is you know, all throughout, especially in the Old Testament, you see the Lord our God is one Lord, that there's one God, that we don't believe in polytheism, as, as in there's multiple gods. But what we believe the Word of God, and we believe when the Bible says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, that that is true. And that the, and later on in John chapter 1, the Bible says, And the Word was made flesh, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father. So we know that that shouldn't take very much to establish that Jesus Christ is the only begotten of the Father, and that um, He is the Word made flesh. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with, was with God, the Word was God. Isaiah 43, look at, we're going to start reading in verse number 3. Isaiah 43, starting in verse number 3. The Bible says, For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia and Seba before thee. Since thou wast precious in my sight, thou hast been honorable, and I have loved thee. Therefore will I give men for thee, and people for thy life. Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east, and gather thee from the west. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from far, and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Even every one that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory, I have formed him, yea, I have made him. Bring forth the blind people that have eyes and the deaf that have ears. Let all the nations be gathered together and let the people be assembled. Who among them can declare this and show us former things? Let them bring forth their witness that they may be justified or let them hear and say, it is truth. Verse number 10, ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. It's an important phrase I want you to remember from Isaiah 43. I am he. We're going to look at another passage in the book of John in just a minute. Understand that I am he. And then there's a colon clarifying who he is. Before me, there was no God formed. Neither shall there be after me. The Bible is saying here, the Lord is saying, there are no other gods. Before me, there was no God formed. And after me, there are not going to be any other gods formed. This is, this is the way it is. There is one God. God is comprised of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. Jesus was not a created being or a created God or, you know, anything of that nature because this couldn't be true then. 
You could not have a before me there was no God form, neither shall there be after me. In the New World Translation, for example, in John uh, 1, 1, the, quote, the verse I was quoting to you, the Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In their translation, the Jehovah's Witness translation, it says, And the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. So they only add one little letter, but that one little letter is very significant. Because either Jesus is God or he is a God, and they, the two mean different things. If we're going to say that Jesus is a God, how does that fit with Isaiah 43.10? Before me there was no God, for neither shall there be after me. Now in a minute we're going to get into other references to other gods. And I'm going to prove to you from Scripture that those other references, when the Bible's talking about there's, you know, because one of the verses that they like to point to is, that, well, there's, there's God's many and there's Lord's many. So the Bible's saying, see, there's many gods. But what I'm going to prove to you from Scripture is every single time that the Bible refers to gods, like with a lowercase g, not referring to God in heaven, but to other gods, it's actually talking about devils. So, we don't have many choices if the, if the proper translation should be, and Jesus, you know, the word was with God, the word was a God. Given the rest of Scripture, if he was a God, but not God, that would be calling Jesus a devil. And like I said, I'm going to prove the things that I believe and the things that I say with Scripture. And I want you to take notes on these things so you could go home and search them out for yourself and be able to determine for yourself if what I'm saying is true, compared against the Word of God. Because ultimately, my opinion doesn't matter if it's just an opinion. It doesn't matter. Your opinion doesn't matter if it's just an opinion. What matters is what the Word of God says. That's what we believe. That's why we're here. This is what we love. This is the source that we go to to find all truth. And if it's the Word of God, there cannot be any contradictions. Because God doesn't contradict Himself. He's not going to give us a book that's just full of, oh, it says this here and it says this here and they're two totally different things and they contradict each other. I'm not going to believe that that's coming from God if there's contradictions. If we come across something like that, usually what the case is is that we are lacking understanding on something. But there is nothing that, that is a blatant contradiction in the Bible. I've seen people come up with what they consider to be contradictions. Not contradictions at all. It really just is chalked up to a lack of understanding. But um, let's continue reading here because there's a few more verses that I want to I wanna point to and I want to illustrate here in Isaiah chapter 43 that are, that are very powerful and, and are very explicit. And, you know, there, there's, not, there's not much wiggle room to say, you know, there's certain passages, especially with parables, where people can say, oh, this means this or this means that, and that are maybe more open to an interpretation. In understanding. But then there's other passages where the verses are very straightforward, pretty literal, pretty, I mean, it's, it, it says what it says, right? You would have to be, in my opinion, dishonest with some of these verses to say it doesn't mean what it actually says. I try to take the Bible very literally, and when I see something written there, you know, even if I don't have full knowledge or full understanding, I'm going to believe what this says to be true because it's God's Word. As is the case with, with you know, John 1.1, 1, 1, the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. I don't have to understand every aspect of how that works, but I see that that's what the Bible says, so I'm going to accept that as being truth and that that is the way it is. And that's not the only verse. Obviously, there's a lot of other verses that we can turn to that will describe the same thing, the same concept, the same truth. Because if it was just one verse, maybe I'm misunderstanding something. I'm still going to receive it as true, but when you have multiple verses that you, can, that you can turn to that are all teaching the same concept, then you really have to just accept it, right? And, and that's why I believe. So look at verse number 11. The Bible says, I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Now I know... And I believe Jesus Christ is my Savior. This is in Isaiah. Now, we don't know the name of Jesus. But the word, the Lord, there, is, and when you see it in all caps in the King James Bible, it's Jehovah. 
That is God. That is a name for God as a whole. Now, oftentimes when you read the Bible, it could be referring to the Father. It usually, it probably is for the most part, but um, you have to, to look at and discern the context who's kind of doing the speaking. Sometimes it's referring to the Lord as being the whole Godhead. Sometimes it's referring to the Father. Sometimes it's the, it's the Son speaking. Here, though, we, it's very clear that the Lord is our Savior. Now, if Jesus Christ is not God, then how can he be a Savior if there is no Savior? When the Bible says in Isaiah, Isaiah 43, 11, I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Jesus Christ is a Savior because he is God, because he's the Lord. Let's keep reading here, verse number 12. I have declared and have saved, and I have showed, and there was no strange God among you. Therefore ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. Yea, before the day was, I am he. And there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it? So verse number 13. Verse number 10, he says, you know, I, 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 you, I want you to know and believe and understand that I am he. And then verse number 13, he uses that same phrase. Yea, before the day was, I am he. And there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it? Verse number 14. Thus saith the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. I believe this is Jesus Christ speaking in the Godhead of being the Holy One of Israel because he came of Israel into this earth in the flesh and he is our Redeemer, the Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. For your sake I have sent to Babylon and I have brought down all their nobles and the Chaldeans whose cry is in the ships. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Turn, if you would, to John chapter 8. And then we're going to go back to John 20. So turn back, if you would, to John chapter 8, keeping those phrases in mind. I want you to understand and believe that I am He. And he says, yea, before the day was, I am He. And that phrase is critical to understand this concept and this truth that fits together so perfectly and so wonderfully in God's Word that we cannot just ignore, skip over, and it's one of the aspects that makes Jesus such a wonderful Savior. John chapter 8, starting in verse number 23. Oh, you're, Rena, you're in 1 John. You have to go back to the, to the Gospel of John, yeah. Right near the, you got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the New Testament. Okay, they're the first four books of the New Testament. So you're going to go to John. You're in 1 John. You've got to go back a little bit earlier. And we're in John chapter 8. I'm going to start reading. You can write down this as a note if you want to look it up later, Rena. John 8, verse number 23, the Bible reads, And he said unto them, Ye are from beneath. This is Jesus Christ speaking. Ye are from beneath. I am from above. Ye are of this world. I am not of this world. Verse number 24, I said therefore unto you, that ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Now, I'm emphasizing this because it is so important in understanding and accepting who, understanding who our Savior is. And when we preach the gospel to people, we preach that Jesus Christ is is God manifest in the flesh that God became a human being and lived among us because if we don't believe right as he said if you don't believe that I am he then you are going to die in your sins dying in your sins is a sure ticket to hell and we know that I'm not going to prove that from scripture you should be able to understand that already from the context here he says I'm from above you're of this world I'm not of this world you have to believe that I am he, or else you're going to die in your sins. And then jump down to verse number 28. The Bible says, Then Jesus said unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he. And he uses that phrase again. And you can search your scriptures, and I encourage you to do so. Look for the reference of the specifically, I am he. Because it is used intentionally and specifically but this is not a phrase that you will see thrown around in Scripture, like, oh, in this context or in that context. It is found 
very, very, very seldomly in very few locations. And I don't think you're going to find it outside of Isaiah and John. But search and, and find out. Look for that phrase, I am He. He says, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. Jesus Christ is the I am He. But what's interesting, and you'll see this, and I, and I think people have a problem with this sometimes. You say, well, wait a minute, now He's just talking about my Father. So He's saying, you know, He's talking to my Father and He's separate, which He is. There are, he's, they're separate persons in the Trinity. But there's still one God. And, and I know, you know, maybe I'm not doing the best of explaining that, but here's a good illustration that I like to use to give the concept of the Trinity. We are comprised in three parts as human beings. We have a body, obviously, we can see that as physical, our flesh. We have a soul. Soul exists inside of us. You can't see that physically, but we know from Scripture we have a soul. We also have a spirit. Okay? All three make up one person who we are, right? But, and they all have their own characteristics. The soul is not the spirit. The spirit is not the body, right? They're, they're all their own entity, if you will. They all make up me, for example, they make up David. If I were to drop dead physically today, my body would be laying on the ground. It would not be inappropriate for someone to say, hey, there's David. Because my body would be laying there, right? That we, we can say that's reasonable for someone to say that. But if I were dead, my soul, my spirit would not be in my body. I'm in heaven as my soul, right? Or as my spirit. Someone approaches me in heaven and says, hey, Dave, that would be appropriate also. So there's three parts that make up who I am. And then, of course, one day we know at the resurrection when Jesus Christ comes back that our old bodies will come up out of the grave and we'll be reunited with them and we will go back to having a three-part personhood, our soul, body, and spirit. So um, there is a separation that takes place for a period of time, but that is just one illustration. And, I, you know, we're made in the image of God, the Bible says. And I believe that is a very good illustration to kind of illustrate who God is, that, that there are three that make up the one. Now, go back, if you would, to John chapter 20. We read over this. We read the entire chapter, but I want to focus in on a particular phrase of doubting Thomas. We're all familiar with the story of doubting Thomas, right? Jesus Christ, after the resurrection, he appeared unto his disciples. It was an amazing event. Everyone was excited when they finally, you know, they're sad at first, and they, they go to the tomb, and they still don't understand the scripture that's talking about his resurrection. They thought someone moved him. They don't know what to think. And then Jesus Christ finally appears to them. You know, they're kind of gathered together, figuring out what's going on. Jesus Christ appears to them. Everybody's excited about that. But Thomas wasn't among them when he first appeared unto them. He wasn't there with the group. So they start telling Thomas, we saw the Lord. We saw Jesus. We, we saw him. We talked to him. And he's just like, I don't believe you. I'm not going to believe you. I'm not going to believe you unless I could put my finger into the holes in his hands and I could feel where they pierced him in his side. He says, unless I can do that, I'm not going to believe you. Right? Very stubborn person. <laughs> so he's, That was doubting Thomas. That's exactly right. And, that, and that's what we're looking at here in John chapter 20. Because John chapter 20 is when he does all these things. Right? And we're going to see here. Let's Actually, I'm going to, yeah, I'm here right now. I don't have this. I'm going to go a little bit further. Get it more in context. Because I'm going to be focusing in on verse 28 and 29. But let's. Let's look at verse number 26. The Bible says, And after eight days again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. So this time Thomas is with the group. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. It's an amazing event, right? Obviously our spiritual bodies, or Jesus' spiritual body, isn't bound to the, to the physical laws the same way that our bodies are because the doors were all shut, yet there he is right in the middle. Jesus appears in the midst of the group, Verse number 27, then saith he to Thomas, so he's specifically talking to Thomas, he says, reach hither thy finger, give me your, give me your, give me your hand, give me your finger, Thomas, I know what you said, he says, behold my hands, here, go ahead, feel it, because Jesus Christ physically rose again from the dead, 
in the body that they, that they crucified on the cross. That's why he had the holes in his hands still. Is him. And he's proving it to Thomas. He's saying, here, go ahead. Feel for yourself. He says, and reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side. And be not faithless, but believing. So, he's proving to Thomas. Now look at Thomas's response to experiencing this, to feeling the whole thing, and, and realizing, yeah, yeah, there is no doubt this is Jesus Christ. He's back. And Thomas answered and said unto him, and this is important, don't miss this, my Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. He calls Jesus God. You are God. Now, the Old Testament, the, the, the Ten Commandments teach us, in the book of Exodus, Exodus 20, says in verse number two, the first commandment, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. That is part of God's laws. God wants all the attention. God demands it. He put those, those first two commandments on not having any God before him and not to make any graven images and not to bow down to them and not to worship any image made in the likeness of man or the likeness of birds or creeping things or, or things of the sea, anything like that. He says you cannot make those things and call them God. First two commandments. Now here's the thing. If Jesus was not God but was of God, right, was a, was a godly man, a godly teacher, a prophet, a messiah, whatever you want to call him, he would have to rebuke Thomas for calling him, you're my God, if he wasn't. If he's going to say, no, 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 Thomas, you know, you should have no other gods before God, because I am not God. He would have to do that. We see other events, especially in the book of Revelation, where John is caught up into heaven. He starts seeing all the revelations, all the things that are going to happen in the future. And an angel starts talking to him. And John gets down on his face and starts worshiping this angel. And he says, get up on your feet. I'm a man like you. Because he doesn't want him worship because he, the worship belongs to God. And he was just a man. So the angel does that because he's being right by God. But look at what Jesus does in verse number 29. He doesn't answer him and say, no, Thomas, I'm not God. He says, on the contrary, he confirms or he affirms what Thomas said. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. When he calls him my Lord and my God, he says, now you believe. Now you get it. No rebuke. Because Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. What a wonderful Savior. What a, how amazing is that? And, and it magnifies the sacrifice that was made. When we understand how much God loves us and God wants us to be with Him, and we're sinners and we've done wrong, and we deserve this punishment because we've broken God's rules, we've broken His commandments, but He loves us and He loves us so much, even though He's a perfect judge, and He says, this is the way things are, I can't go back on my word, I've already told you that if you break my laws, you're condemned, but I love you and I love you so much that I'm willing to pay the price for you. And to be manifest in the flesh, to live the, perfect, uh, live the perfect life, give us the example that we need, that he shows us. This is, this is how things are done. God coming down, taking on the form of a man, living the righteous life, and then sacrificing himself for us, paying that price. Now, I told you that I was going to prove to you from the scripture that the, you know, there's, there's gods, plural or, or, or lowercase g, is used in scripture. And I just want to prove to you that when the Bible is referring to that, it is not talking about like a real God that's like, that's like our God, like God the Father. There is, there is no other gods but one. There is only one God in existence no matter what planet, no matter, no matter where you're talking about in the entire physical realm, there is no other God but one God. Because 
of what we already saw in Isaiah 43. There's no God's form before me, neither shall there be after me. And that's in reference to a real God. But I want you to turn, if you would, these are the two places we're going to look, or a few places we're going to look at, actually. Um, we're going to look at Psalm 96. We're going to look at Isaiah 37. I'm going to try to get through these pretty quick. I've got a lot more notes, so if, if you, you don't have to turn to all of these. Write them down. Psalm 96, Isaiah 37, 1 Corinthians 10, and Deuteronomy 32. Psalm 96, verse number 4, the Bible reads, For the Lord is great, and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. So there's that, that reference, right? You say, oh, well, there's other gods. Above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. You're saying, yeah, there are other, the reason why the Bible even uses the term as other gods is because people worship and serve other things that they call God, that they think they're gods. You look at, um, you know, Hinduism is a good example of this. They believe in multiple gods. They believe that there are these other gods that exist, and they think that they're real. You know, they, they have statues of things that, are, that they say represent their god, and they think that they're real, and they exist, and they have certain power, and they have, you know, that, that, that it's a real thing. But the Bible teaches us that that is nothing. It's nonsense. It's not real. They don't exist. It's just an idol. An idol is just the work of man's hand. It's just, it's just some wood or some metal or some, you know, some, some things, some, just part of God's creation. You know, it's just physical material. There's no power behind that. There's no God. There's no real God behind that. But people look to it and worship as God. So they need to be referred to in the, in the sense that people understand. There were Roman gods. There were Greek gods. You think of Zeus. You think of all these things, you know, all, all this mythology. And that's what it is. It's mythology because those, those are not real gods. They don't actually exist. There is no host of Zeus and Jupiter and Saturn and whatever. I'm probably mixing Greek and Roman. I don't even know. But, but all these different gods that you have, you know, people actually believed that they were real. That is something that people genuinely thought was true. But just because someone is sincere or genuine in what they believe doesn't make it actually to be true. It doesn't mean that that is the truth. But we have to recognize that they look at them as being gods. So this is who the Bible is referring to when it's talking about any other gods than the one true God. The Bible says they're, the, the gods of the nations, they're idols. Isaiah 37 verse 18 says, of a truth, Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste all the nations and their countries and have cast out their gods into the fire, for they were no gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone, therefore they have destroyed them. And again, the Bible is just saying there, you know, we threw their gods in the fire. You know, they, they were destroyed because they're not really gods. Because you could take an image or an idol and just destroy it, and then there it goes. It's gone. It's never coming back again because it's not even a real God. It's just the work of men's hands. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 19. This is the reference where, we're gonna, where the Bible's talking about them actually being devils. Because I do believe that there are angels and there are devils. The Bible talks about both. I do believe that there's a spiritual warfare. I do believe that people have been visited by angels, and I do believe that people are visited by devils. And the devils go around to deceive, and the angels are ministers there to help. But the devils don't always look evil or bad because they're there to deceive. If you knew and, and, you know, any great con man is not going to come to you looking like some thug. They're going to come to you dressed really nice and to give you a good appearance and try to make you gain your confidence. The devils do the same thing. They appear to people. And I, I, I'll tell you this much. I believe, that, I believe that Muhammad was sincere and that he had visions. And I believe that he was met 
with a being, but I believe that that being is a devil and not an angel of God, not, not a good creature, a bad one. I believe he did have visions. I believe he did have communication with a, a supernatural being that is a devil that, that gave him this new God and this new religion of Islam. There is no real God behind that, but the, the only God that would be behind that is the devil that, that spoke to Muhammad. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 19, the Bible says, What say I then, that the idol is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? But I say that the things with the, which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. So he's saying, you shouldn't have fellowship with devils. You shouldn't have any part of that. They may think that they're making sacrifices to God or to a God, but the truth of the matter is they are not. They are making sacrifices to devils. And we need to make sure that we can rightly apply Scripture today and understand that there are other religions and other you know, belief systems out there that regardless of the sincerity of the people, they still are serving and worshiping devils. It's the truth. Nothing is, you know, things aren't that much different today than they were back then when it comes to people's faith. There's still a lot of deceitfulness going on. There's still a lot of people just being, being tricked into these things. But thank God for giving us his word so that we could discern and understand the difference between them. Deuteronomy 32, verse number 16. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. I'm just going to read this for you. Deuteronomy 32, 16. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Deuteronomy 32, 16 says, They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods. With abominations provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up whom your fathers feared not. Again, a reference referring to gods being devils. And you'll see over and over again, the Bible talks about these gods. It's not talking about real gods. It's talking about fictional beings that people create that are actually just devils. It's not a real God. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse number 4. The Bible reads, As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols. And again, the, con the context here is talking about idols. It's talking about false gods. Making sacrifices on idols. We know that an idol is nothing in the world. And we know that. We know that there is nothing other than wood and, and metal there. Just an object. And that there is none other God but one. See, we also know that there is only one God. For though there be that are called gods, we know that there are entities called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many. But to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. There is one God, there is one Lord, and we believe that Jesus Christ is a deity. He was God in the flesh. Turn to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter number 3. We know that only God is righteous. Only God is holy. Only God is perfect. Only God is, is completely pure. But we are sinners. As a natural man, we are naturally born with the, with the sinful flesh that drives us to sin. And there is not a righteous man upon the earth that does good and doesn't sin. We are all sinners. I've had people actually claim that they never sin. And it's almost comical. It really is because... It's just demonstrating your total ignorance of what God's Word says. Because when we really start digging into this book, we start to see 
yeah, I, I may think I'm pretty good, but there's a lot of things that I do that God said not to do. I think the, big, the Bible says the thought of foolishness is sin. You go ahead and tell me you've never thought a foolish thought. Go ahead. Good luck with that, because I'm not going to believe you. <laughs> not going to happen. And that is the easiest, probably mildest of things. And if we're honest, we know, we know we've done so many other things anyways, but that is just like, yeah, even, even sweet old grandma that everybody loves that wouldn't hurt a fly has thought a foolish thought before. Hate to break it to you. Okay, but that's a sin according to God's word. It is a sin. Um, we're all sinners. Romans chapter 3, look at verse number 9. The Bible says, what then are we better than they? And he's talking about the difference between the Jews and the Gentiles. Say, so, well, are we better than them? Because we already see, you know, the Gentiles were, were in this, this idolatry and you know, sinful practice and all this other stuff. He's saying, well, are we better than them? He says, no, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. We're all sinners. As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They're all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. And the reason why I'm focusing in on Romans chapter 3 here is because then I say, well, what about Jesus? What about Jesus? If Jesus is just a man, then doesn't that contradict Romans chapter 3? That's quoting the Old Testament, written after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, quoting scripture before Jesus Christ and just saying, hey, there's none that doeth good, there's none righteous, no one's good, all are sinners. Was Jesus Christ a sinner? According to the Bible, he wasn't. Turn if you would to Mark chapter 10, because in 1 Peter chapter 2, I'll read this for you, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, the Bible says, for even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. Jesus Christ had no sin. He was without sin. He was perfect. So, is there none that was righteous? No, there is one, Jesus Christ. But this is in reference to Jews and Gentiles. This is talking about human beings. Jesus Christ was, yes, was he a man? Yes, but he was also God in the flesh. Jesus Christ is exempted from uh, contradicting these scriptures because he was God. If he was simply a mortal man like you and me, well, the Bible says there is none righteous. There is none that doeth good. Jesus Christ did good. Jesus Christ was righteous. Jesus Christ was without sin, and there was no contradiction there. Because as Jesus said, if you're, if you're in Mark chapter 10, look at verse number 18. There's a man that approached Jesus Christ, and he said, Good master, and he called him good. And Jesus said unto him, he responds to that in verse 18, Why callest thou me good? He said, Why are you calling me good? There is none good but one, and that is God. So he's saying, well, wait a minute. Why are you calling me good? There's only one good, and that's God. And that's a true statement. Jesus Christ isn't lying. There is only one true, and that's God. But then the next question is, well, was Jesus good? If Jesus was good, then he is God. Because he himself said there is none good but one, and that's God. Otherwise, you would have to say, if Jesus is not God, you'd have to say Jesus was not good. Those are the only two options you have here. Because Jesus said there is only one good, and that's God. Jesus Christ either was God or he was not good. And the reason why people are not considered good is because they're sinners. God is perfect. Jesus was perfect. Jesus was perfect because he is God in the flesh. What a wonderful Savior we have. John chapter 15. You turn, if you would, to, um, if you go to Exodus chapter 12. 
I'm going to try to get, get through these, this la these last couple points here quickly. Exodus 12 and Hebrews 9, and then you don't have to turn anywhere else. You know, I put a bookmark in Hebrews 9. You're going to go to Exodus 12. I'm going to read this for you. The Bible says in John 15, 13, Jesus Christ himself said, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. It's the greatest demonstration of love that anyone can do is to lay down your own life for someone else. That's what Jesus Christ did for us. That's what God did for us. He laid down his life in order to pay for ours, to pay for our sins, to pay the penalties for our sins. What a wonderful Savior to do that and to demonstrate his love for us, to lay down his life. Revelation 13.8 says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. So the Bible says that the Lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. That the plan of Jesus Christ being born into this earth, living the perfect life, dying on the cross and raising again from the dead was the plan from the foundation of the world. He is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. It's his plan all along. His love for us was to sacrifice himself for us, to atone for our sin, to fix our problem by shedding his blood and being our Passover Lamb. That's why the Bible refers to Jesus Christ as the Lamb, because He's the Passover Lamb. Our sins are paid in full through His blood. Blood. In, in Exodus chapter 12, I just want to. We're going to look real briefly at an aspect of the Passover and in, in the the way that God specified that the Passover had to be performed. The rules regarding. Now we. We don't practice the Passover anymore because we recognize Jesus Christ as the fulfillment of the Passover. That's why we don't have an altar here where we sacrifice animals, as they did in the Old Testament. Now, the Old Testament, they believed on the Lord. We believe in the Lord. But the, the practice was different because those carnal ordinances, those sacrifices, all were painting a picture. They were demonstrating, they were showing the Lamb that was to come. They were giving them the teaching that there was a Savior coming, there was going to be a sacrifice made that would cover all of their sins. And this was demonstrated especially through the Passover offering. Of course, we know the, the reference to Passover, the very first Passover, where the word literally comes from, is when the children of Israel were going to come out of Egypt, that last plague that God put on the Egyptians, upon Pharaoh and upon everybody in Egypt, he said he's going to send the death angel through that night. And anyone that did not make the lamb sacrifice and apply the blood to their house, apply the blood to the doorpost of their house, as the death angel went over, if he didn't see the blood, then the firstborn was going to be killed in that house. But if he sees the blood he's going to pass over that house. You are saved. Your household is safe. You're saved. There is no death. You will have life when the blood is applied to you. Jesus Christ shed his blood. We need his blood applied to us. And the way that we get his blood applied to us is by putting our faith in him. That's the way we apply the blood to the doorpost. Receive him. Believe on him. And with his blood applied to you, you have eternal life. Great. What a wonderful Savior. Exodus 12, verse number 5. We're going to read some of the details here about how they were to practice the, 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 the Passover. Verse number 5 says, Your lamb shall be without blemish. No spots, no problems, just as Jesus Christ was without sin. That's what this was demonstrating. The lamb is perfect. The lamb doesn't have any blemishes. There's no broken bones. There's nothing wrong with the lamb at all. It's perfect. A male of the first year, you shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Just as Jesus Christ, when he was brought before Herod, what did, what did the Jews say? Crucify him, crucify him. All is, the whole congregation shall kill it in the evening, and they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and in the upper door posts of the house wherein they shall eat it. 
And they shall eat the flesh in that night. And this is a point that I want to bring up. They shall eat the flesh in that night roast with fire and unleavened bread. And with bitter herbs they shall eat it. And it makes a further distinction. Verse number 9. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water. He's saying don't boil it. Don't eat it raw. You have to eat this roast with fire. His head with his legs and with the pertinence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. And that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. It's a very important picture or aspect of what the coming lamb was to do to be the fulfillment of this Passover lamb that they practiced for years and years and years and years until Jesus Christ came. Hebrews chapter 9. It's the last place I'm going to have you turn to. Hebrews chapter number 9. Jesus Christ, not only did he die on the cross and was risen three days later as we're celebrating today, his soul, because his body was in the tomb, his soul had to go somewhere for those three days and three nights that he was dead. You're turning to Hebrews chapter 9. I'm just going to read for you from Acts chapter number 2. Some people believe that Jesus Christ's soul went to heaven for those three days and three nights that he was, he was dead. But that is simply not the case as we saw here that the importance of, of his flesh being roast with fire and that nothing is to remain of it overnight but that the whole, the whole of the lamb needed to be roast with fire. Anything that was not eaten needed to be roast with fire. In Acts chapter number 2 Verse number 31, the Bible says, He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ. So talking about the resurrection, talking about when Jesus Christ came back from the dead, it's quoting uh, the book of Psalms. It says that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. So referring to the resurrection, Jesus Christ's soul was not left in hell. In order for his soul to be left in hell, it had to be in hell. The punishment for our sins is hell. Jesus Christ came to be the atonement to pay for our sins. He died up on that cross. Yes, they buried his body in a tomb. Yes, but on that day that he died, his soul descended into hell. Paying in full what we deserve to pay before being risen from the dead after three days and three days and conquering death and conquering hell, which is why the Bible says that he has the keys of death and hell. He's conquered them. He's risen. Amen. What a wonderful Savior. What a Savior to do that for us. To have the heart. To have the love. To know what He had to face. To know what He had to do. To suffer. To bleed. To die. And to go to hell. Because He loves you. Because He loves you. Individually. Yes, He loves us all. Oh, but He loves you in particular. And died for you. What a wonderful Savior. Hebrews chapter 9. Let's get through this real quick. I'm almost done. No, uh, starting in verse number 11. The Bible reads, But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. He obtained it. He got it. He bought that eternal redemption. He entered into heaven once into the holy place with his own blood. The Bible says in verse 13, For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctify it to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot, to God as that lamb without blemish, without spot. He was perfect. He was without sin. He offered up himself. Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. 
For a testament is of force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth, whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. It's describing when Moses was given that first covenant, that, that testament, the Old Testament, the law, it was given through blood. It was, it, you know, uh, animals were slain, the blood was sprinkled, and that's how it was sanctified. That's how the temple was sanctified. That's how the tabernacle was sanctified. It was given with that blood. Verse 22, it says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. Blood had to be shed for our sins to be covered. And it was. Verse 23, It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. What that's saying is that it was necessary because the tabernacle that God gave unto Moses, the design, the pattern, the altar, the sacrifices, everything that was given to Moses, it was a pattern of what already exists in heaven. There's a tabernacle in heaven. And God was giving him, that's why it's so detailed. That's why when you read through Exodus, you know, some of those parts that, are, that may be a little bit difficult to get through in your Bible reading because it's telling you about all the sockets and it's telling you about all the curtains and it's telling you about who's going to bring it up and who's going to take it down. It's going to tell you about the basins and the, and the shovels and all the, all the tools and all the instruments. And it's very, very detailed and it tells you how much they weighed and what they were made of and all this stuff. But it was real detailed because God wanted it detailed because he says, this is the way things are in heaven and I'm going to make this as a pattern or as an image of the way things are up here. So, obviously, heaven and earth are two different places and the, and the, the physical world isn't exactly the same as that spiritual realm in heaven, but God wanted to create on earth something that mimicked or imaged what's in heaven and he told them, well, okay, here's what you have to do. You have to offer the blood of bulls and goats, and they need to be shed, and they would do this on a regular basis. That was good enough for, for, for the time he's giving it to you to make an illustration, to make an example. But the cleansing or the sacrifice that's offered in heaven, the real sacrifice, has to be much better than that of an animal. It has to be much better than bull or goat or something like that. And that's why it had to be dedicated with the blood of Jesus Christ. Verse 23 says, It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So year after year in the Old Testament, they would have to keep going into the holy place and offer the sacrifices. Saying, but that was just a picture. Christ, Christ's sacrifice only needed to be made one time. It was done one time, and that covers all. That one sacrifice is perfect. It's way better than the sacrifice of a blood of a bull or goat. This is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That covers the sins um, of, of all. And he, uh, he performed that, and that actually was carried out then in heaven, where Jesus Christ ascended back up to the Father and was able to sprinkle of his blood on the mercy seat for us. What a wonderful Savior. Just as Jesus Christ died and paid for our sins one time, what he did is enough to cover our sins for all time. Thank God that God knows the beginning from the end. Thank God that when Jesus Christ, even though it was some 2,000 years ago, that he didn't just pay for the sins of the past. 
He didn't just pay for the people who lived before him and just say, okay, well, we know what all the sins were up to this point and Jesus paid for those. No, because God knows everything. Jesus Christ bare the burden of sin of all time. God knew every one of us individually were going to live on this earth. He knew when our birthday was going to be. God knows what the rest of our life is going to be like. He, he has knowledge of that. He knows. He knows what you're going to do tomorrow. He knows we're going to eat for breakfast tomorrow, or if you're going to eat breakfast. He knows what sins you're going to give. He knows it all. He knows the beginning from the end, which is how Jesus Christ was able to take all of our sins, the sins of the whole world, when he died on that cross. But this is also why, once you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you receive eternal life. It's not temporary. Because when you apply the blood of Christ to you and what Jesus did for you, when you make that application to you, just as His payment was for sins of all time, past, present, future, the application is made to you for sins of all time, past, present, future. My future sins that I'm going to commit because I'll tell you right now I'm not perfect, that I am a sinner, the foolish thoughts that I might think in the future, the, the other sins, whatever lies, whatever other thing I might do that is contrary to God's Word in the future, anything that I do has already been paid for by Jesus Christ and it's already been applied to me. I have forgiveness of sins. That's what, the only reason why I could stand here and say I have eternal life. The Bible calls it eternal. I know that it's forever. My works have nothing to do with it. I was not a good enough person to receive entrance into heaven. Because I deserve the other place. Because of my sins. And after receiving the free gift, I still don't deserve heaven based on how good I am. I'm still a sinner. I, I didn't do anything to earn my way there. I still don't deserve it. But God loves me and He gave me a free gift. He paid for my way into heaven. And I'm thankful for that. Now, I personally want to show God that I love Him and show Him that I'm thankful for that and show Him how wonderful I think that the Savior is. So I'm going to try my best to do what's right. But that is not going to get me there. I have no hopes of any of that getting me there. My Savior doesn't need any help saving me. He did all the hard part for me. And what He did was sufficient. My works have nothing to do with whether or not the Savior is going to save me. Putting my faith in Him determines that. And if the Savior doesn't need my help to save me, then He doesn't need my help to keep me saved either. He seals us. We're secure. What a wonderful Savior. What a wonderful gift. What love. Let's not forget that. I love spending time. We're going to go. We're going to eat, eat dinner with family and some friends. And, and you know, we're going we're to have a nice meal. We're going to enjoy each other's fellowship and company. I love coming to church. And I personally have the benefit of being able to preach the message. But even if I wasn't preaching, just being able to hear about our wonderful Savior and how great He is and, and worthy of all honor and praise. Let's not forget the sacrifice that was made for us and, and the, the, the glory of the resurrection and the, the victory that was made over sin and death and hell. As far as I have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much, so much for that wonderful free gift of salvation. Dear Lord, we love you. We worship you. We serve you, dear God. And I pray that you would please just uh, lead us, guide us, give us instruction from your words. God, I pray that you would please help everyone here to not be forgetful about our challenge this month, that people would put aside the time necessary to be in prayer to you, to be talking to you as our Heavenly Father, Lord, that we would ask you for the things that we need and that you would give us direction and, uh, and, and response to your Lord. We love you. We thank you so much for your love. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.